It's a real pleasure for me to introduce to you my friend Ron Archer. Um, I've known Ron for 40 years, I think. Um, and so Ron is one of the best teachers I've ever met. Uh, he's the one who inspired me to become a teacher. That means he's older than I am. But Ron uh, has been a teacher at Saddleback Valley. He's been a math teacher, an English teacher, an activities director. He's been a mentor teacher. He was Orange County Teacher of the Year. He's been a um, journalism teacher, yearbook advisor. If you name a, a job at a high school, Ron has probably done it, and not just done it, but uh, hit it out of the park. And I'm so pleased that he's here to share with you uh, the story of the good teacher. Please welcome Ron Archer. Good morning. I'd like to uh, say hello to all my friends in the back right. That's where I sit. Uh, listen, I, I appreciate so much the opportunity to be here um, because when school starts, I ask my wife always to pray for me because the first two days without the kids are often the most depressing. Because it's not uncommon for me to have experienced, hi everybody, the air conditioning doesn't work, the classes are full, we know. There's a plumbing problem, but we hope to have it fixed by the end of the first week. Uh, we, oh, we didn't get those books. We have a new program for you because the scores were a little low. Hey, have a nice year. <laughs> and, I, and I come out of the, the in-service feeling like, fine, I just, just give me the kids. Just give me the kids and I'll be fine. Stay out of my room. <laughs> Stay out of my room. <laughs> ah, we are of the same mind. <laughs> I want you to know that good teachers, which you already know, good teachers are reflective. They think about what they do in the classroom. The California Standards for the Teaching Profession says that being a reflective teacher is one of the hallmarks of being a good teacher, to think about what you do. So I want to spend time this morning talking about the good teacher. Okay? And, and I'll tell you straight up, here's what I think. Behind Common Core, behind California state standards, behind the shifts, behind all the three-letter words that stand for programs, there is a good teacher. Curriculum doesn't make good teachers. Programs, standards don't make, yeah. Okay, okay I, thank you, I'm done. That, thanks, thanks for stopping by. I think there's a lot of confusion that says if you, if you learn the curriculum, you're doing well. No, I mean, yes, but no. Behind all those things is a good teacher. So you know what, I, I think maybe we ought to not worry so much about being great. If you're great, somebody will come along and give you an award, okay? And, and that's wonderful. But a good teacher is always easy to spot. And I'm delighted to work really hard to be a really good teacher and then let somebody decide if I'm great on top of that, okay? So I want you guys to think about the idea of being a good teacher, that behind every program, every curriculum, every bit of technology, there is a good teacher. So let's talk about that, not as a burden, but as a time of being reflective. Raise your hand if you understand what I'm doing here. Okay, I'm not trying to make this tough for you, but I do, I'd be really happy if when I'm done in a few minutes here, you say, you know what, I'll work on that this year. I'm, uh, maybe not now, because I've got to go laminate stuff, okay? But, <laughs> but later, later, I'll work on stuff. <laughs> you guys are funny people. Let me talk to you about three things I think good teachers have to do. Good teachers, reflective teachers, like yourselves, have to ask themselves tough questions, okay? Here's the first question you might want to ask yourself, if you haven't already. Why aren't all my students going to be equally successful and what does that have to do with me, okay? What? My kids are not going to be equally successful. They're in my class. They're in my district. OK, well, it's time to wake up. All right, they're not going to be equally successful because of all the things that happen to them on the way to your class. Your most successful kids fall apart when their family does, or their dog dies, or they get hurt. 
this cruise, this thing that looks so good on paper will turn when events come to your classroom. And you know what I'm talking about. The question is, if you have this tremendous responsibility, if you've taken this leap, I am a teacher, then what happens when kids are not successful? All of your kids won't be successful. They won't, and it won't be anything you can do about it. <laughs> Depressing, but true. The question is, the question is, What's that got to do with me, and why aren't they all successful? It's easy to know why they're not, but what's that got to do with you? Here's what it's got to do with you. You have to also ask the question, why aren't I giving up? Why am I not giving up? Good grammar. Why am I not giving up? You know why you're not giving up? For the same reason that you decided ahead of time that when those kids showed up, you would teach them. For the same reason you became a teacher, because you will prevail, okay? So the question becomes, if I know they're not going to be successful, how not successful? How, how much of a complete failure is this going to be? Right? And I think it's really important when you talk about teaching, which is a creative art. Um, I had a quote from a book I read about someone who was involved in a, um, a creative art management situation where they had to work with artists and, and um, engineers to create theme parks, amusement parks. And the person said it was a, a big deal in his organization to make sure that the focus was always not no because. The people with the money always said, no, you can't do that because. No, you can't do that because it won't work. And he said it was a big deal for him to try to get the people he worked with to say, yes, if. And I think that's a big deal in the classroom. We spend a lot of time going, it won't work, no, because. That kid's not going to be successful because of this and this and this. And that's an important point. We, have, we can't bear the burden of the things that we can't help. But we can say, yes, if. No, that kid's not going to make it because he's da 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 da. OK, good, done. Yes, that kid's going to be successful if I do this. Do you guys see the difference? Now, how much can you do? Teachers can only do so much. But because we have hope, because we care about the kids, we're willing to say, Hmm, what about that if? If and hope are tremendously connected. So you have to ask yourself the question, why aren't my students going to be equally successful, and what does that have to do with me? Now, if the answer is my kids are not successful because I'm messing up, <laughs> the kids don't know those mitosis and meiosis because I got confused when I was teaching them. All right, well then, how about maybe it's a little time to reflect on maybe take some flashcards up for yourself you know, when you teach it. All right? <laughs> So let's not just assume, oh, I am a teacher. I've jumped off. I've made the commitment. You guys have work to do, too. But that's an important question. Would you guys agree? Yes? OK. Let's keep going. Why can't I teach alone? Ah, leave me alone. Now, you can do that to the administration, maybe, or, or the district, or whatever. Leave me alone with my kids. But what about you and your colleagues? Okay. Why can't I teach alone? And for some of you, you're like, oh, no, I can. I can. I can. <laughs> Lunchtime, don't think so. I'm grading papers, all right? Uh, faculty party, don't think so. Got the family. You know what, also, I don't want to see people after the week is over, OK? <laughs> I've already talked a lot. I'd like to just go home and be very quiet, OK? <laughs> why can't you teach a load? You know why? Because teaching is very difficult, OK? Teaching is a lonely, lonely job in some cases, day in and day out. You don't have people coming in your room every morning, welcome to school, we honor you. We brought you, we brought you a muffin, may your day be merry and bright. <laughs> you slog in, somebody's been waiting since 7.30 since their parents dropped them off, so they want to come in and chat while you were going to grade papers. <laughs> and you're like, why don't you do some homework while I work? We have a difficult job, and in order to do that job well, we need each other. Oh, fine, so now what, I have to go have lunch with everybody so I can be like all social? No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. See, and you guys who are laughing, you're like, I, I'm like, why would I go have lunch with everybody when I can grade papers, right? But how are you making teaching not a solo activity for yourself and for others? For example, you don't have to go sit in the lunchroom 
to, to have somebody who you can share what you're doing with. Hey, I'm thinking about doing this, okay? I have a teaching uh, partner. Uh, it's common at the high school level sometimes to combine curriculum. And, and I have English credential and math credential. And so the English side of me joined with a US history teacher. And we put the curriculum together. And then this was when laptops were like new and happening. We, we made a blended curriculum, blend integration of technology in a block schedule. Okay, so it's like 60 kids in a class. This is back when laptops had like dongles and ethernet. That was it, no wireless and things like that. This teacher and I discovered that he would say something like, I want the kids to do this. And I'd say, well, what if we do this? And we would come up with things that we both were like, wow, that's a cool idea. And we acknowledged I had no idea what I was going to say until he asked me what he wanted. And then I would say, well, let's try this. And he'd say, well, I'd want this. And I'd say, well, do this. The collaboration between the two of us enhanced both of our teaching. It wasn't in the lunchroom. It wasn't at some in-service. It's because we both wanted to do a good thing for kids, and we'd been put together in that position. You're in a position to do that with the people around you. Hey, can we talk about this? Can I give you an idea about what I'm doing? Well, if I was a great teacher, I wouldn't be sharing, because great teachers don't share. <laughs> weakness. You know, like, eh, eh, eh. Weakness, weakness. No, weakness. That's called collaboration. It's called making things better. Okay. So why can't you teach alone? Because it's lonely. It's ugly. Okay? We have to talk about kids that they had last year. I used to kind of think, well, like, I don't want to know about the kid. I want a fresh start. I want a fresh start. And then I'm like, well, why didn't somebody tell me he sets fires? How come I didn't get that information? You know? I, one, one year I got a thing. This was years and years ago. It, does, it doesn't happen now. Years and years ago, I got this thing, I got this thing in the, my mailbox, like, I don't know, two weeks. No, two months after school starts, says, you know, Freddie is bipolar. And I'm like, as he's been to the North and South Pole, I don't know, what is, what is Freddie? And I took it to the office, I go, what does this mean? Nobody knew. Nobody knew at the time. So I looked it up and I'm like, Freddie could be dangerous in my classroom. And no one's, you know, no one's talking to me about it. I think you need to talk about kids because sometimes what kids have done, have you ever talked to another teacher and it's October, November, and you're like, yeah, well, you know, they do that. And, oh, yes, their parents like that. Well, why didn't you talk of that before? I, I get it. I think it's a really good idea to give kids fresh starts because they change. But what kind of key information helps you teach better when you're not teaching alone? Am I making you think at all here? You're kind of getting quiet, which is good. <laughs> Whose classroom voice is the most meaningful? If I took a video camera, you know, and I came and, and looked in your room, I'd want to be able to see that you're somehow answering these questions during the day. If I took a video camera to, to your room and I, you know, I left it there all day, who would be talking in your classroom? And whose voice is the most meaningful? Well, the teacher's voice, because we're the teacher. The children's voices, because they are learning. OK, here's the deal. Sometimes the kids' voices need to be very, very quiet, OK? And the teacher's voice needs to be very strong. And sometimes the teacher's voice needs to be very, very quiet, and the kids need to talk. Ask yourself the question, whose voice is most meaningful in the classroom? And I think teach good teachers are going to say, it depends on what you're doing. Do you take the time to say, how is, am I going to use my voice today in relationship to the kids, OK? It takes a long time to work through kids' voices in learning. And I think some of the things you guys are learning, or not you're not learning, is being brought forth a lot in Common Core is let the kids discover. Let them talk about it. Let's begin. And I'm thinking, awesome. Absolutely. I would love to be able to say to kids by simply asking questions, not telling them anything, to let them bring the knowledge and bring the critical thinking. But you guys know it takes time, and especially <laughs> Bless you, elementary people. It's like, have any of you ever been to a place, you know, where there's a, 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 a geyser? I, I went to Yellowstone and, OK, so six minutes later, the Yellowstone story <laughs> is over. And you're thinking, OK, our discussion time on my lesson plan is up, and only Freddie has been able to speak, and everybody else still wants to tell us. Do you know what I'm talking about? So it's like, well, OK, thank you for telling me I need to help students discover, but that's going to take all day. Now, what would you like me to cut, OK? We can discover, but we can't learn our math. So the, the deal is, <laughs> the deal is, think about how you use your voice. Okay, whose voice is the most meaningful? 
Are you taking the time to listen to kids? Are you using your, are, are you listening the way you want them to listen to you? Entirely focused and not thinking about something else. Oh, I'm a teacher, I have to multitask. Well, I listen to the response, I have to think about what page I'm gonna be on. Awesome, but the question is, do kids' voices give you clues about how all the kids are feeling? Do kids' voices give you clues about how to adjust that lesson plan because you just figured out they don't know the basic information that you were gonna build on to build the lesson? So you have to continually ask yourself the question, who's in the classroom, whose voice is most meaningful? How good is my curriculum? <laughs> what? Of course my curriculum is good. I am a good teacher. Well, yeah, but then somebody else next door, they got video cameras in that room and they're giving them an award and you're like, well, I thought I was doing well, how can you didn't stop on me? Teachers have this really tough responsibility to feel like they're doing the very best and again, not all teachers get recognized. Good teachers say, look, I am doing my best. I'm being reflected, I'm working. You can keep the camera out of the room. I know I'm doing the right thing. But to do the right thing, you have to ask yourself this difficult question, how good is my curriculum? And if you are still using the same worksheet that you came up with 30 years ago, and it's a good worksheet, you keep using it, all right? You thought I was gonna go, no, you have to throw it out. No, if it's good, and it's made it through the 80s and the 90s, <laughs> and it's made it through the 2000s, you keep doing it. If it's good for kids, you do it. If you're using the same sheet because you're like, oh, I'm good to go, using the same laminated stuff from last year, they had never been in my jungle, no problem. Got the same worksheets, worked last year, no problem. My kids are a little different. We don't use that book anymore, but it's, it's not a problem. I'm too busy. That's not good curriculum. Would you guys agree? Now, the, the word curriculum, we get a lot of trouble because, like, what's curriculum? What are standards? What's methodology? What's curriculum? And there are a lot of definitions. And we get into this idea that methodology is curriculum. And there's been a lot of complaints nationwide about common core curriculum or common core methodologies being the same thing as common core, right? It's not. Common Core is a set of standards that says, what will kids learn? The curriculum is the set of lessons that you put together. This is my definition. The lesson you put together. And then you teach those lessons. Teachers are responsible for taking a standard, or collaborative. D districts will start to come up with things pretty soon. They'll say, let's take the standards, let's create a curriculum. And then they may say, let's go with, for lessons, which is fine except maybe it doesn't work in your room and you have to be able to raise your hand and go, love the lesson, but not my kids, okay? Well, why aren't your kids up to the standard? Because they're below standard, okay? So I have to work with them. So I'm gonna have to modify that lesson. Why? Because I'm a good teacher and I love my kids and I know what I'm doing, okay? <laughs> sorry did I, if I hurt anybody's feelings, I'm really sorry, but that you, have, you can't just say, well, this came down from the district, we'll use it. G getting together, pooling your knowledge, coming with lesson plans you can use, great idea but being responsible for that plan and saying, my curriculum is good for my classroom is really important, okay? And understanding that you need to take the ownership of those lessons. It's very common when new standards come out, if there's too many standards, uh, everyone sometimes says, well, you know, we'll, we'll just have to see how it goes. And I, I'm really confident you work in a district where that conversation will take place as soon as it needs to take place. We're having trouble getting to these, so what about these? And you guys who are, have been around for a while with the California standards uh, that were previous, eventually districts started going, well, uh, let's, what are the essential standards? You know, meaning, what are the most important ones? Because we can't do them all. English teachers at the high school level generally went, wah, wah, we'll never be able to do all of them anyway. So we're just gonna pick the ones that are most important. If you can't get to everything, of course you have to pick what's, what's most important, okay? And you have to say, why am I not getting to them? You have to ask, how good is my curriculum? And a big challenge, if you're so set that you're just gonna bust out stuff from last year and you know it's gonna work with your kids, good for you. If you're ready to just roll through another year, don't. It's not another year, okay? It's a new year, it's a, it's a new Tust and Connect situation. You have new technology that you don't know how things fit. You have to keep saying, how good is my curriculum? And by the way, if you'd like to blame a district curriculum, I don't know how much you have. If you want to blame a district curriculum, perhaps it's okay to own the fact that that curriculum needs to be modified and you know how to do it or you need help in how to do it. 
you are responsible for the lessons that take place and they are directly connected to how well you know the kids in that room. Does that make sense to you guys? These are not easy questions and you will ask them over and over and over you know, all year long as you teach. The second thing that I think a good teacher should do is be the verbs. I talked about being a, uh, bringing in a video camera to the room. If I came in and brought a video camera, or maybe I could just save myself time and install permanent cameras in your room and just watch you from afar or whatever. If I watched you, could I see you being the verbs in these ways? Pay attention to all of the T words, the apostrophe T words, okay? Apostrophe T words, I wrote them down here. Can't, won't, don't, couldn't, wouldn't, and shouldn't, okay? Well, I, I, don't, I don't ever want to say can't. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Teachers can't, okay? We would love it to not be able to sleep. We'd get more grading done and we could laminate more stuff, okay? <laughs> but we have to sleep. We have kids. We have lives. We have nutritional needs, all right? <laughs> and people don't come in and go, how are you doing? <laughs> you don't look like you've eaten. <laughs> uh, you're wearing the same clothes from yesterday, did <laughs> Did, did we go home? Well, no, I had, I had some laminating and grading to do, and I had to get it back. Are you paying attention to the T words that are important to you as a person? Is it okay for you to say, Mrs. Jones, I can't call you after 5, even though you emailed me at 8.30 wanting to know what the work was because Billy didn't write it down. I can't come to your house by email after work because... I want to live, okay? <laughs> you have to be able to say that that's going to happen, all right? What shouldn't you be doing that you're doing now? What should you be doing? Th those apostrophe T words that haunt we teachers, I can't, oh, I shouldn't do that. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't do that. I, I won't do that. Re-examine those. Pay attention to them. And when I look in your room, am I seeing you taking time for yourself? Am I seeing you taking time to be in collaboration with other teachers? Because we talked about that's important. Am I seeing you taking time to, to empower kids instead of enable kids, which I'll talk about in a second? Okay. So what are those apostrophe T words that haunted you last year that you need to pay attention to this year? Is there something you won't do this year that you did do last year? Make it, maybe you don't want to put it up on your wall right in front of you know, the desk. No parent contact after four. You know, maybe that's not what you're going to put up there, okay? But maybe you can begin to move in directions that help you grow as a person and a professional. Reach the doodle kid. You know who the doodle kid is. The doodle kid is the kid who's out there doodling. And you're like, oh, you're doodling. You're not focusing. Now, what does a good teacher know? The doodle kid may be doodling to help him focus because his mind is going so fast that he's... 10 layers below what you're teaching in the questions he's asking. You're saying today, we'd like to learn about volcanoes. And the kid's like, I know about volcanoes, but I'm wondering about magma. What are the temperatures of magma as it goes below the Earth's surface? And that's the kind of kid who sometimes doesn't have the control to realize that a lesson needs to take place, right? It's the kid who are like, well, that, that's a good question, Johnny. And, and then you're like, I'm a good teacher. We'll just fold Johnny's question into the lesson. And you're like, yeah, look how I brought that together. But then Johnny keeps bringing up the questions. And you're like, Johnny, <laughs> let's have some other people have a chance to not share, OK? <laughs> Johnny, I, there's a way I need to do this. And I, I think it'll help for most people. So would you like to write those questions down? And if we don't get to them, you can come in and snack. We'll talk about them. Do you understand what I'm talking about? The, the kid's curiosity is so intense Okay? that if he doesn't have a focus because he understands you have a need to talk to those kids, he needs to doodle. You know there are kids who need to doodle in your class in order to help the class and help themselves focus. Doodling is not evil. Right? Now you know there are kids who don't need to doodle because then they're giving themselves permission to be bored and learn how not to engage. I always talk to parents about, about kids in the class. This class is so boring. You're so boring. I just want to put my head down on the desk, and you won't let me sleep. How come I can't sleep? And I'm like, well, you know what? Your mom and dad would like you to leave home soon. <laughs> and eventually, your mom and dad would like you to get a job so you can support yourself, and they can stop paying for stuff. 
the number of jobs that allow you to get paid for coming and going, this job is so boring, I just want to put my head down. There are no, there are, I know, I'm sure there's some, because he's always like, I'll bet there's a job where they do that. No, I don't think so. There's not many jobs where you go in and put your head down and go, I'm bored, and they pay you. <laughs> there are also not job. there are also plenty of jobs where you can't go into the board meeting and doodle your way through the boss's presentation. The doodle kid is an important kid, because sometimes the doodle kid is saying, I have needs that I need you to know about, but I don't know how to do anything but doodle. Now, the doodle kid who's drawing pictures of him you know, cutting up his dog or something, well, there are some needs there. I'm sorry. There are some needs there as well. Okay? So if you have a kid who's doodling, you have a tremendous opportunity to connect. Well, that's an interesting picture. Why is your house on fire? Right? If you, if you say, ah, a doodle kid, you're mine, because you are expressing some feelings through your art that I need to know about to help you learn. Ah, you're a doodle kid. You need to learn how to stop doodling, because you're going to take your doodle and share it with another kid. The doodle kid is somebody that you want to look out for to make their educational experience better, and you a better teacher because of how you deal with the doodles. <laughs> Get yourself a t-shirt, doodle dealer. Just deal with it. <laughs> Generate I know questions as springboards. Again, we talked about this earlier in discussion. A really good way to see how kids are, are learning is to start a discussion where kids say, I know. This is what we already know. And it's, it's good teaching practice. What do they know? What do they want to know? What do they learn? <laughs> they don't know anything. They don't want to know anything. Okay. <laughs> awesome, then. You have a challenge, right? But, but finding out what kids know is really important. And I think if I, if I were to bring a video camera in your room, I would want to see you at least knowing the doodle kid was there. I would want to see that you were paying attention to the apostrophe T words in terms of yourself and your others, your other colleagues and, and members of your family. Okay? Um, and I would like to see you generating I know statements as springboards for discussion. What, what do you know? And especially when you have kids repeat it. Um, it's really powerful when kids repeat what they already know, which brings up a really key point. Sometimes there's a rhythm of using your voice with kids or the way you structure lessons where you have an answer and you want that answer. And the kids know you want that answer. And of course, good teachers don't do it, but not so good teachers are like, what do we know about such and such? Kid gives an answer, you go, uh, no. You go on. And, and anybody who's laughing would be like, no, I won't do that. The rest of you are like, why? Just tell them no and move on. No, that's not good. All right? The idea is, though, we want to know what kids really know, and we want them to say it. Because when kids say things, right, they, they earn, it, earn it. That's a good idea. And they learn it, and they own it more. Um, if you say to kids in a class, what did you learn today? And you really want to know, you listen to them differently than, what did we learn today? Volcanoes, have magma. OK, good, but talk to me. What else do you know? You guys understand what I'm talking about? Have them tell you what they really know, and you be listening for that. And use that for a springboard for discussion and a springboard for learning. Having kids say, this is what I know. This is what I know I learned. I'm, a, I'm tutoring a 19-year-old who's working on a standardized test for entrance in the military. And I will say, OK, so no, so what did you learn by this mistake we just made? And he, he, his eyes kind of glaze over, and he goes, that I shouldn't have made a mistake. And I'm thinking, you've, you've been in a place where no one really asked you what you know or made it your responsibility to know something. Does that make sense to you guys? And, and he was just like, yeah, I made a mistake. And I said, well, no, 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 what did you learn here? What do you now know about solving a problem? And he's come to the point where he now will say, well, I went too fast on that problem. Okay? So having kids make I know statements are an important part of, I think, being a verb, being the action. When I say be a verb, I mean I want to see it in action. Discuss it, don't just show and tell, very similar. Okay? If, if you have a lesson plan where you're just going to tell them something and show them something and then give them something to do, you don't get the richness of their collaboration and their discussion. If discussion is not part of what's going on in your classroom because you've got so much to cover, we can't talk about this, kids. I've just got to shove in your face and we'll move on. Not a good idea. Okay? So think about how much time. And I realize some of you are like, look, it takes so much time. I have third graders and they ha I, can't get, I can't do it. Of course you can't discuss all day, but how much discussion am I going to see in your class? Because discussion has such great value for the kids, and I think the good teacher uses it. 
Ask questions that aren't answered yet. <laughs> there are people who ask questions that aren't answered who are annoying. Have you, ever, have you ever said to the kids, well, OK, I'll see you on Monday. Monday's a holiday. We're not going to be here. <laughs> Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. And you're like, OK, I think it was only obvious we all knew Monday was a holiday. I said Monday because I have been here, OK, for 80 times 20 weeks. OK, that's like <laughs> lots of weeks. And Mondays usually come first. My bad. <laughs> isn't, isn't Monday a holiday? Oh, that's right. It is. On the other hand, isn't Monday a holiday? Oh, you're right. OK, we shouldn't have it due on that day. OK, so we'll need to move the deadline. I'm sorry. I missed that. Thank you for asking that question. Asking questions that haven't been answered yet can go either way, OK? You haven't answered correctly the answer to the question, what is Monday, teacher, OK? But, but what about questions that kids haven't thought about the answer yet? What about things that your colleagues haven't thought about? You can use this in the classroom. Ask questions that haven't been answered yet. Don't answer the question first. If you teach math, you're going to want to ask them the next question. And if you don't tell them the answer, they're going to put together what knowledge they have, and they're going to be able to answer the question. Good math teachers, a lot of times, don't really introduce new concepts. They, they derive new concepts from the knowledge that's already there. Okay? So if you ask questions that haven't been answered, meaning you, you haven't asked them, the kids haven't asked them, you have a fascinating way of taking one thing and building on another. This doesn't work. And like, well, well, what happened after the Civil War? We, we haven't studied the Civil War, so we don't, we don't know. Okay. What happened after the Civil War? We haven't thought, we haven't done that yet. Well, yes, we have. We've talked about the Civil War. So what happened after the Civil War? We don't know. What do you think happened? Well, I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of burned houses. Well, what do you suppose that meant for the people in the houses? They're kind of sad about that, and they lost a lot of money. Who do you suppose was probably going to give them the money? I don't know. Who? who, who who gave the people the money back for their houses that got burned in the Civil War? Teacher, oh master of all knowledge, I stand by to enhance my learning by your answer. <laughs> well, the government, or nobody, or whatever. Do you guys understand the idea? Finally, teachers have to have mantras. You have to have something to say to yourself every day. Okay? You have to have saying things that you say every day when you come into the classroom. One of the things you have to say to yourself every day is, we're always on this side of paradise. <laughs> Okay. We're not going to be on in paradise. The educational system is not a paradise. <laughs> News flash. <laughs> okay. It's not because it's full of people who are struggling to make it better, and that's a good thing. If I am expecting paradise, I'm expecting something that's by definition paradise. How do you make paradise more perfect? Paradise is perfect. You can't make perfect more perfect. So, so we're always on this side of paradise. Now the question becomes, instead of saying, this is so bad, right? No, I hate, no, I'm not having a good day because. How about, yes, I'd have a better day if, OK? It's a whole different way of looking at things. And you have to just realize every day before you go in the door, I'm always on this side of paradise. And every once in a while, there's a day when they're all there. There's a day when they're all focused. There's a magical moment where you go, I'm getting paid for this. Yes. It's so wonderful. It's so right. But most days, there are fire drills. There's a fly in the room. <laughs> OK? As long as there are flies, there is educational disruption. All right? Sorry. We're always on this side of paradise. And you say that every morning when you go in to your, to your job or to your work. Related, of course, the better is yet to come. <laughs> I left out the word best, OK? The best is yet to come. Perhaps striving for better is a better step than striving for best. <laughs> because it's a, it's a process. We're a part of an educational process that involves people and government and hierarchies and paperwork. And yet, it affects our classroom. So every morning when you put the, the key in the door, assuming it works, we're always on this side of paradise. The better, I'm sure all the keys in Tustin work. I am so saying. The better is yet to come. 
And I should, I should pray about that. <laughs> I should meditate. I should reflect. I, I don't know what your reflective time is like, whether it's praying, whether it's meditating, it's reflecting and reading. Maybe it's all of those things. But if you're so busy getting to better every day, if you're so busy being the verb, if you're so busy asking the tough questions, that you never take time to step back. If you never say, kids, mommy's going in a room now, daddy will be in charge, mommy's not doing laundry, mommy's not grading papers, mommy, if you were to open the door, mommy would just be sitting and looking. It's okay, <laughs> okay? <laughs> mommy is thinking about her life. And one of the things I'm going to think about, besides you and Daddy, is students, okay? And, and, I, and I, where do you do your time of reflecting? A lot of times that's in collaboration with your, with your teaching partner, your people in the building. Do you go out to coffee with people you teach with? Not to talk about the other people you teach with, but to talk about what you teach, okay? Is there time to spend thinking and, and praying and meditating about your kids? How many times have you felt you know, so bad about what you said to a kid because you didn't understand the whole circumstance? Why, why do you have to go to the bathroom all the time? Oh, now I know. Well, why didn't somebody tell me, right? How can I respond differently the next time you know, when there's so much going to the bathroom going on? Uh, you understand what I'm talking about. You have to take the time to step back and, and look at your job. Good teachers must ask tough questions of themselves. Good teachers are verbs that you can see acting out the teaching profession. And good teachers need mantras that they say. You are right now, right there. You have a tremendous responsibility. I've given you all sorts of stuff to feel guilty about and, uh, and to think about. And I hope you'll spend the time doing that. It's important for you to remember that good teachers always, always, always make a difference. I'll stand behind that. Okay, you make a difference because you care. I'm going to cry. <laughs> make a difference because you care. You come back to teaching for that reason. When you spend that time reflecting, you understand that you got into this job to make a difference. It's a cliche that's been around since people were holding, um, what do they call them, protest signs in the 60s, making a difference in the world, as, as Dr. Franklin said begins here because our kids go and they, they inherit the world. Good teachers always, always, always make a difference. When my son uh, went into the Air Force and he got um, out of boot camp, we were walking around and people are coming up and going, thank you for your service, thank you for your service. And I'm like, oh, I heard that on television, but oh, they're saying it to one of my kids. And I'm standing there and then I start thinking about what does that mean you know, to be in the military and what kind of service is he going to, you know, uh, to, to provide for the country and provide for the world and provide for people. And I thought, wow, that's, that is cool. It's a real honor okay, for him to, to be doing that. And so I need to finish because I, I, I can't, I've tried to pull myself together to not cry. Um, so thank you for your service. We as teachers have a tremendous job to do. And we need to be thanked. You have been thanked tremendously this morning by the district you work for. Let me add my thanks to thank you for your service and remind you that because you work to be good teachers, because you ask the embarrassing questions of the people you work for and the people you work with, because you take the time to be the verbs, okay? If you're a smart teacher and you're a good teacher, you will not be denied the ability to make that difference. Thank you so much.